God, we thank you. And we bless you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We lift you up, God. We exalt your holy name. You alone are so worthy to be praised. Welcome, everyone, in the name of Jesus. Welcome. For this is the day that the Lord has made. And I want all of us to rejoice and be glad in it. For God is so worthy to be praised. If this is your first time coming on, welcome. If you're a returning visitor, welcome. If you are a part of the CLF in my family, welcome, welcome. I want to turn your attention to something. And I want to introduce a good brother here in the Lord. And he's going to talk to you briefly about worship. Come on, David. Good morning, CLF family and friends. Welcome to this morning's church service. I want to read a little something that I wrote recently about the topic of praise. One recent morning, my, as my wife and I were talking, I felt something in my chest. I'm not certain I really felt it physically, but it seemed real enough to be physical. I felt a tangible urge, a need, a drive, a compulsion to praise God. So right in the middle of our conversation, it was time to stop talking and start expressing my love and praise for Christ Jesus. To express that love and praise, I began singing. I sang a little chorus based on Hebrews 13, 15. The words are, Come, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Come, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. Come and offer sacrifices. Come and offer praise unto the Lord. What followed my chorus was certainty in my spirit that Jesus is in control. With everything going on currently, sadness, loss, heartbreak, and plain craziness, Jesus is in control. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. All power is his. And with all his power, he loves us, forgives us, died and rose again for us. And what are we to do in return? We are to love him, trust him, believe him, and obey him. In addition, we should talk to him and listen when he answers, and he will answer. We talk to him through our praise, prayers, and worship. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, we worship you. God, we worship you.
anybody worship the Lord. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our adoration. Oh, Lord, I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. 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 God, I worship you. I worship you. Almighty God. like you I worship you oh Prince of Peace that is what I love to do I give you
Somebody needs you to touch their heart, God. Touch their heart, God, like only you can. Bring peace and comfort to their soul. Oh, God, we worship, we worship. a sweet spirit. Oh God, we don't want to leave your presence, God. We don't want to leave your presence, God. We don't want to leave your presence, God. Oh, you're sweeter. You're sweeter than the honey, God. Oh God, you're sweeter. You're sweeter than the honey in the honey. Jesus, sweeter than the day.
will praise your name, God. Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. We lift up your name, God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. something about the name Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. We thank you. We glorify you. We lift you up, God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Praise be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. We glorify you. You are so worthy to be praised. Worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Ah, we praise your wonderful name, God. We magnify you, God. You're so worthy to be praised. Worthy to be glorified. Hallelujah, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. I need you guys to pray for my family in Cleveland, my first cousins. I just got a text from my mother that my 19-year-old cousin just passed away at 745 this morning. Ah, name of Jesus. Hmm. Hallelujah. Bless your name, God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Bless your name. Bless your holy name. You're worthy to be praised. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, yes, Lord Jesus. Father, we praise you. We glorify you. We lift you up, God. As we move forth in your word, God, continue in the worship, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would strengthen us. Let the words that come from my mouth be your words, Lord God. Hide all of me that you may be exalted, Lord. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Today I want to talk about something that is so, so, so important. And you say, well, everything that in the word of God is important. Yes. 
But this particular thing that I want to talk to you about today is very, very important. It's, it's called Kingdom Disciples, the missing key. In my studies of Kingdom Disciples by Tony Evans, I've been reading, it speaks about how Kingdom Disciples are in such shortness. It's a short supply in churches today of kingdom disciples. Mm. And therefore resulting in powerless Christians attending powerless churches and having a powerless impact in the world. Let me say it again that we have a short supply of powerless Christians resulting in powerless and attending powerless churches and having a powerless impact in the world. I want to talk to you about the missing key. And I want to use this example in the sinking of the Titanic April 15, 1912, when over 1,500 people died in the Atlantic from the sinking of that large, massive ship that hit a large iceberg. And you're probably saying, well, that was the thing that actually did it. Well, I'm going to challenge that theory when I'm going to tell you and share with you now that the cause was a missing key. A man that was in second command named David Blair was in charge of having the key to the crow's nest. And in that crow's nest, that box, was a pair of high-powered binoculars. And that David Blair, that person, would go to the top of the crow's nest of the ship and that crow's nest, that key for those binoculars would be used to, to notify them of any upcoming, oncoming danger that could be happening. Well, on this particular day, on that day of April 15, 1912, as the ship was scheduled to move off and to, to set sea, David Blair was reassigned. That's not the issue, reassignment, is that David Blair forgot to give the key to the crow's nest. And because he forgot to give that key to the crow's nest, they didn't see the potential danger that was ahead. Therefore, the missing key that was unavailable to the men on that ship led them to a deadly crash and killed over 1,500 people. The missing key. In the church today, the same tragedy is happening in the churches across the globe today. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? Because the missing key in the churches today it comes down to one thing. What is that one thing? Discipleship. The missing key is discipleship. Well, because the missing key is discipleship, this is why it, Tony says that there is a shortage of kingdom disciples, which causes them to attend powerless churches. And they have a powerless impact in the world. Understand that until we as believers, we believers, start investing. Come on now, start investing and making disciples. We will continue to fail in our calling to live as heaven's representatives on earth. All of us who name the name of Jesus 
are heaven's representatives on earth. We are kingdom ambassadors. And here's what I would tell you. That Matthew 28 is not, is such a commonly used scripture, but what we fail to see is this. When God says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Well, in the Bible here, it says to go out and what? You go out and take the gospel out. Baptizing them and teaching them. Well, when we are not doing that, when we are not living to that, we are in disobedience. Disobedience. Mm. The power, authority, abundance, victory, and impact promised in God's word to his own people, to us, will only be ours when we understand and align ourselves with his definition of discipleship, period. Until we do that, we will continue to walk in a powerless state. Mm. Therefore, no matter how many Christian activities that we do, no matter how many revivals that we go to, no matter how many Bible studies we have, no matter how many fasts we go on, until we walk in the power of God's word in its entirely, we will render ourselves to be powerless. And more disappointments and losses will take place. Here's a key statement. Discipleship is the missing key to a life of authority under God. I'll say it again. Discipleship is a missing key, a missing key to a life of authority under God. So what I'm saying to you is that when we don't walk in that, we are walking around powerless. But when we surrender to his lordship and obedience, we will be able to unlock the power and bring heaven right here on earth. Well, pastor, what is disciple? What is a kingdom disciple? Good question. It is a believer in Christ who takes part in the spiritual development process of progressively, uh, progressively does not mean that I just stay in one place, but progressively is a continuation of learning to live a life of submission to Christ. A life of submission. We can't take the Father's word and skim through it and pick and choose what we want to follow. The goal of the kingdom disciple is this, is to have what? A transformed life and to replicate God's kingdom values in the lives of others. Remember that through his kingdom disciples, God exercises his rule from heaven to earth through us. Pastor Angie, through us, when we align ourselves with being kingdom disciples, God says he's going to exercise, whew, he's going to exercise the kingdom, the, his rule, his reign, his authority is going to be exercised through us, Minister Roger. Through us. That's a heavy load. But we always wonder why our prayers go from here 
to right here. And the reason why is because we're not exercising or walking in authority. Not that you haven't been given that authority. So after Jesus rose from the dead, he took steps to ensure that there would be followers. Jesus called a meeting on this particular day. And according to Matthew 28, 16, 16 through 20, the 11 disciples proceeded to go to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. Don't we have that now in the house where people will come in, they hear the word, they experience the worship, they see the power of God moving, and yet they still remain doubtful. How is it that if I'm sitting here in the presence of God, where I can visually, physically see him, watching him, walking with him for three years and seeing the things that he's done. I seen him give sight to the blind. I seen him heal the lame. I seen him raise somebody from the dead. And yet, and yet, we can remain doubtful of his word. Whoo, how can we do that? Mm. All authority. God says this, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them and listened to what he said. He said, all authority, not some authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I believe he covered everything. He says here, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. I want you to write those in bold letters if you're taking notes. Go, baptize, and teach them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the very end of the age. What if I told you the people who went to this meeting the, was the 11 disciples, and if we go back and look at, there was the 500 followers from 1 Corinthians 15 and 6 that were following him. And then he appeared and said here in 15, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and 6 says, where there then we appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. 500, 11 disciples, look at our count. But here's the other piece. There is neither a third group of people who were at the meeting. And you probably say, who is that? Much larger group of people has indirectly part of that post-resurrection meeting, Pastor Angie. All Christians, including me and you, were invited to that meeting. How so, you may ask? Well, Jesus said, I'm with you always until the end of the age, right? In Matthew 28 and 20. Beloved, we're not at the end of the age. That means we who are here now are supposed to be doing what he's saying right now. The end of the age is talking about us. The 11 disciples have gone on to glory. The 500 and followers are gone on to glory. Who's left? Us. So we still have that mandate over our lives. Therefore, the age hasn't ended yet, so therefore you and me are still living in that age. Jesus spoke of as we are also part of the meeting Jesus called. And see, here's the thing. Satan and his crew, they thought when the crucifixion happened, it was a party like none other. 
Friday they gigged, Saturday they gigged, oh, but Sunday. Woo, oh, but Sunday. The resurrection was God's way of saying to Satan that you lose, chump. You lose. Because my son, what, is alive. And all authority is in what? His hands. In short, Jesus is still the reigning champion and still, what, in charge. And so since Jesus is still the reigning champion and in charge, the authority that he has given us still exists. That's what the word authority in Matthew 28 and 18 means, in charge. In charge. When Jesus said that all authority was in heaven and on earth, he was saying that he possesses the legal right to wield. Wield is to hold and use that power. He has that legal right to that power. And when Jesus says that all authority was in, that was in heaven, was, was his in heaven and on earth, it reminds us of the prayer he taught the disciples in Matthew 6 and 10. What does he say? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's power. Your will be done. He's talking to us. So according to Jesus, a disciple's first concern should be that God's will be done here on earth. God's will must be done here on earth. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't a maybe. It was a mandate over those who are still living in this age. And guess what? God is still with us. Hmm. Wow. It needs to be done completely, perfectly. No questions, no objections, and no debate. When God said that, there was no, well, what do you think? Well, can we take a vote? The majority is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is the end of the debate. Too often we got an opinion. Well, your opinion didn't raise Christ from the dead. Your opinion didn't give him, give him all power. Your opinion did not defeat death, hell, and the grave. It was none other than the word of God. Who is the word of God? Jesus. Satan and his crew were the only ones that attempted to challenge Jesus. Only one that attempted to challenge God in heaven. Therefore, they were evicted right out. In Luke 10, 18, it says this. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In Revelation 12, 7, 9, he says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought. But he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world, he was thrown to earth, and his angels were thrown with him. So he got the boot. He got kicked right out. See, because Jesus' plan is this, that there would be a group of people who function as his legal representation, representatives here on earth that will reflect and implement God's will right here on earth. Who is that? Point to yourself. It is our role, our job. And we can't do our role and our job being comfortable. Along the process, along the journey, you're going to meet opposition. But it does not negate your assignment. 
Can you imagine if Jesus in that time on his road, because his focus was the cross. Can you imagine if he got held up or he decided to quit because things got hard? Look, it got, how hard can it get when you are facing crucifixion? How hard can it get when you are already nailed to the cross? None of us has experienced such, such an, a crazy thing. A painful, none of us. Jesus paid that cost for all of us. And we can't do what he says in his word? Whoo! This would be the role and responsibility of kingdom disciples. Here's the role. The discipleship process is designed to transfer, transfer Jesus' authority to and through his followers. So if he's to do that, Mikhail, throw your mask on right quick, come here. And, and Jeremiah, throw yours on and come here. If he is to do that, this way when people want an idea of what's going on in heaven, they can check out the lives of believers individually and collectively. Throw your mask on. Come up here for a minute. So I'm going to use Jeremiah. Stay right there, Jeremiah. The missing key, we said, is discipleship. And when we are walking in authority, my job as a person who knows Christ, who is a legal representative here on earth of Christ, my job is to take the key that was entrusted in me and to go over and transform that key onto another. Now his job is to go, he sees somebody that he is to go, and he's walking in that authority, that power. Stop for a second. Now here's what you need to understand. Back up for one quick second. Here's what you need to understand. He's not going in his own authority. He is going in the authority of Christ. But I'm going to show you something what God does before he gets there. God already goes over here and sets up the situation. He's trusting that God is doing this. God is making Mikhail a person of peace. Right? When he sent out his disciples to go out, he was sending them out to people of peace. Because he said, if they want of peace, you are to shake the dust off your pants and keep it moving. But right now, God knows there is something that Mikhail is ready to receive, the rich reward of heaven. He's ready to receive it. Jeremiah is now walking this authority that Christ has given him, and he transforms, transfers the authority. Now, this doesn't mean that Jeremiah is powerless. This doesn't mean that it's a one-time key. But if you look on here, there's a bunch of keys. And what that means is that he's going he's to teach him, and he's going to show him, and they both will have these keys, and they are to go out everywhere, transform, transferring this authority to others. That's called disciple. Ship. They are walking in discipleship. They are kingdom disciples. Thank you. They are kingdom disciples. Our job is to do that. It is not to hold on to the keys and come into the church and give a believer, Sister Cheryl Quinney, give her the key. And then Quinney's going to pass the key to Nita. And then he's going to pass the key to anger. And then we're just going to circulate the key in the house. Therefore, you have not gone out. You've only stayed within. And this is what a lot of churches are doing across the globe. They are circulating the word inside. There is no fresh air coming into the house. Woo. We are circulating around the house. I'm just going to go to Jennifer and 
and she's already got her hands up worshiping God and praising God, studying. But I'm going to go over and speak a word into her life. Man, look, we can't go nowhere like that. And this is why we wonder why the house don't grow or the house don't advance. Growth isn't having a house full of people. Growth is raising up the supply of kingdom disciples. That's growth. When we can go out to the world and we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ and we can baptize them and then we can teach them and then they're going to go out. And then they're going to do the same thing. It doesn't take our power away. Guess what we do? We go back out. We rest. And what do we say rest is? We abide in the things of God. We rest in his will. He prunes and gets us right, takes stuff off, sends us back out there to do what? The same thing. I know I'm talking right. Woo. We as believers are to exercise heaven's authority and understand that kingdom disciples, kingdom discipleship and authority go hand in hand. You can't be powerless and be a kingdom disciple. And you can't be a kingdom disciple and not have power. They go hand in hand. They're together. Quinny, they're they're together. In Luke 9, 1, it says this, summoning the 12, he gave them power and authority. Look at that. In Luke 9, verses 1 through 2, summoning the 12, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. Whoo! You telling me, Deb, that I have the authority and the power over Satan and that I have the authority and the power to speak healing into your life. Jesus. And we want to tell the devil, man, that devil will trip. That devil kicking my butt. When have you ever heard Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson say somebody was whooping their butt? When have you ever heard Michael Jordan say, they are killing me. Whew, I can't do this no more. Time out. We don't have that luxury. And we don't have that DNA in us as losers. We are victorious by design because we've given our lives over to Christ. Last week I told you you're unstoppable. But the only way you're unstoppable is when you're walking in the purpose and will of God. He sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That's your job. That's my job. But let me put a quick note in this. Marcus. The, how can I say this? The, the job and the mantle of authority does not just lay on the pastor in the church. It does not just lay on the evangelist in the church, the prophet. It does not just lay on the minister. In other words, we all have a title and as believers. And so our job as believers, as believers, I don't have more authority than you. As believers, we are to go out the same assignment that I have, you have. We want to think that the job and the only job of getting people to come to know Jesus is the man or woman that stands behind the sacred desk. He didn't say, pastors, bishops, apostles, priests, I want you to go out and don't worry about the congregation. You think out of those 500 people who followed him that they were all 
fivefold ministry people. We all have a job. And we have the same job. And guess what? When I stand, see, but more stuff is going, I'm going to be held at a different level of accountability when I stand before God. But guess what, beloved? Y'all going to stand at a level of accountability. How many people have you brung to know who I am? How many people did, did you go and did you baptize and did you teach? And if your answer is, no. In Acts 8, the 8th chapter, verse 12 to 13, it says, but when they believed Philip, wow, as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Even Simon himself believed, and after he was baptized, he did what? He followed Philip everywhere and was amazed as he observed the signs and great miracles that were being performed in Philip. We should be living representatives of the kingdom of God. People should look and see things going on in and through our lives. Not that we are trying to say, hey, look at me, because you without Christ is nothing. First Corinthians 4 and 20 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter, now watch this, listen to this good, the kingdom for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but power. If you are somewhere running your mouth about Jesus, but you're not exercising and walking in authority, you just you just flapping them gums. You just running your mouth. You saying a whole lot and ain't saying nothing. Well, I don't know the whole Bible back and forth. God didn't say you have to know the word of God back and forth. That's not what he said. But you know, look, we all know enough to we saved. We know enough to tell people about our walk and what happened. Share our testimony. Take them to Romans. And if you got, if you lose, if you're lost there, go call up a friend who know Jesus. You don't necessarily have to call the pastor. Call up a friend who knows Jesus because you should be walking with someone that knows the Lord. You can't just leave Pookie and Ray Ray out there like that. That's bold. Think about it like this. You can jump in the water and have a good time. Pookie jump in and he drowning and you can't save him. You can walk through life and be under the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Pookie sitting here getting slam dunked, beat up, drop kicked, and everything else, and we just watch and we'll say it, this lie we always tell. I'll pray for you. I know I'm talking right. I, ain't, I may not be talking what you want to hear, but I'm telling you the truth. I got an assignment today to tell you the truth. Let's talk about victory. We know that Jesus defeated Satan and his evil army. In fact, when Jesus was crucified, we know hell was throwing a party. We know that. But when the father got up, mm, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. Here's a question for you. What is our role as followers of Christ? What's our role? who are left here on earth. I want you to think about that. 
put something in your notes. Those of you on Facebook Live, jot that down. What's your role as a follower of Jesus Christ? Prior to Jesus' crucifixion, he answered the question when he shared the parable of the nobleman who went on a long journey and left sums of money with his servants. He said, look what the nobleman said to his servant. And, he's, and this is in Luke 19 and 13. He says, and this is the King James Version, he says, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. He gave them quite a bit of money for the year. And he said unto them, occupy until I come. What he's telling them is that stay in that place, do the work, and, while, and when I come back, so you know some people like, you know how when your mama leave and you're home by yourself, and she says, make sure that the house is clean, the first thing we do is we get that remote control, or well, back in the day, you turn the little knob with the, with, the, with, the, with the rabbit ears, and you trying to, and you sit the little TV on top of the, the big console because the sound came out better in the bottom. But the picture looked good at the top. And we will watch Barnaby Jones, we'll watch Maud, we're gonna watch Sanford and Son, Good Times, we're gonna watch Kimber the White Lion, we're gonna watch Scooby Doo, we're gonna watch all these shows. Time is still ticking. All of a sudden, you hear the key going in the door. But your mama says, occupy while I'm gone. Mm. In other words, do business for me while I'm gone. I'll be back. Jesus has took a trip. And he's saying, I'll be back. But in the meantime, here's an assignment for you. Occupy that assignment until I come. Keep doing what I told you to do and keep advancing. I've already gave you the resources you need to keep going. See, you can't say, well, God, I couldn't do that because I ain't got no money. I don't have no resources. I don't have no Bible. I ain't have no lights. I ain't got no gas. I ain't got no transportation. No. He's giving you a year's wage. He's saying, occupy, occupy till I come. Keep teaching. Keep baptizing. Keep on going out and getting people in the name and the power and authority of Jesus. Keep doing your job. Mm. Keep doing your job. See, even though Satan and his army was defeated by Jesus, Satan is still on a mission and he got a lot of stuff and tricks up his sleeve. He has a lot left gusto in him. Haters always want this. They want you to be miserable like them. Am I right, Nita? They want you to be miserable. They are, the, what's that, the crab in the barrel. People who don't walk in authority don't want you walking in authority because they're going to say, well, he or she, they think they all that. No, you just not walking in what I'm walking in. Whew. But too often we give an ear to the powerless. We give an ear to the powerless. We, we hear Satan talking. We hear him saying to us, don't do that. Oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. No, you should do that. But if God gave you the authority and the power, and he's already defeated the enemy, what is a buster going to do with a black eye and a swole head going to do and give you some authority? What are he going to tell you? It's always the one that's powerless. It's like, you ever see the one, I'm, a, I'm sorry, but I got to say this. In school, the one who had the best jokes in school and talked about people like a dog was the ugliest one in school. (laughs) 
this ear up here, this ear down here. I'm sorry, I regress. I'm sorry. I just had to say that, though. It's just true. But they told the best jokes. Mm. I digress. I'm sorry. Side note. The church should not be concerned about just adding numbers to the roll or increasing the attendance in the Sunday Sunday schools or Bible study. That's not our main concern. You can have a thousand people sitting in your congregation and they are sitting there and some of them are on automatic pilot. Praise God, praise God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pastors say praise God, praise God. We are in here playing this big game. Because we are short of kingdom disciples. We're short. And we need more kingdom disciples. We don't have to get a big, huge church. We got 900 seats in here. But guess what? If we fill it with 900 or if we fill it with 10 and they all are kingdom disciples, we are a powerful army for the Lord. God showed Gideon that, didn't he? He's about to face over 1,200 men. And he rocked his stuff down to 300. And he was, and he was victorious. My God. Remember, Jesus gave his disciple and the entire church final instructions. And the final instructions was only one command. Make disciples. There are three participles that explain how to do that. Three of them. And that's a word form from a verb and used as an adjective ending in ing. Going, baptizing, teaching. I'll say it again. Going, baptizing, and teaching. A disciple is a person who has decided, who's made a conscious decision that following Jesus Christ takes precedent over all things. Precedent, what does that mean of importance? Another way to look at it is that disciples look and act, wow, like the one he or she is following. The disciple should look and act like the one he or she is following. A disciple intentionally chooses Christ and his will over where? Their will, their own will. Jesus should win out over us. Mm. Even at their personal expense, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you a whole lot, Winston. It's going to cost you something, son. You better believe it's going to cost you. But keep in mind, our salvation is free. And our entrance into the kingdom is assured forever. When we place what? Our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But it's going to cost you something to become a king disciple. It costs in the way we choose to spend our time, our talents, our treasures for God, and his glory rather than our own. Here's some food for thought. Our inheritance into the kingdom will be determined by the degree of faithfulness with which we serve the king as disciples here and now. Our degree. Mm. Look at look at Mark 8, verse 34 to 36 says, calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life 
will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? Mm. It's going to cost you something. And you have to be willing to go through it. You have to make a choice and you need to be progressively growing in your walk. You can't be dormant in your walk. This actually doesn't mean that we can just go from the bedroom to the living room. Uh Uh-oh. I'm not saying that you can't be online looking at service. I'm not saying you can't be studying your word in your home. But I am saying that who are you discipling? Who are you teaching? Who are you baptizing? Mm. Jesus wants us to identify with him. Even if that means experiencing rejection and suffering, none of us like to be rejected and certainly none of us want to suffer. Jesus wasn't speaking to unbelievers when he said this. Rather, he was addressing those who had already decided to follow him. He's telling you, Angie. He's telling you, Keisha. He's telling you that your role, that your responsibility is to go baptize and teach. Go baptize and teach. If we had to sum up the total job of the believer, of the church, who is the church? Us. If we had to sum it all up, Cheryl, he's saying that we need to go, we need to baptize, and we need to teach those about the things of God. At the end of it, he's not going to call me in and say, son, Harold, let me see your book. Let me see your roster. How many people were coming to your service? Let me see the data. He's not going to say, well, how many people over there were you actually in that program? What was happening over there? He's not going to ask me that. He's going to ask us this. Who have you brung to the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Who have you went and after? Who have you baptized? Who are you teaching the gospel? Jesus wanted them to know what being a disciple would look like if you seek to preserve yourself from inconveniences and difficulties that come from identifying with Jesus, you will lose out on the abundant life that Christ promises that is to experience a relationship with him now. Now. And and an eternal reward later. But if you are willing to deny yourself, that's telling your desires, no. Woo. Telling, can you imagine telling your desires, your wants, no? That's hard. I don't know about y'all. Y'all may have it all together, but I don't have it all together like that. Sometimes I want to tell my desires, look, I'm going to beat them to the answer. Come on. Come on, bring a friend. I'm just keeping it real. What, I mean, because whether I say it out of my mouth, but my actions are doing it, I'm saying the same thing. When my desires become more important than the will of God, there's certain things we just want. Am I by myself? Online, am I by myself? I'm learning how to speak to both. Let me take a minute, a second, real quick. 
My wife put me some hot stuff in this thermos, but you can't gauge if it's cool or not. So I gotta like kind of ease it. And it's still hot. So I've been sipping on that real gingerly. Cause you can't see it coming. And you can't blow in there, don't do nothing. Woo! You will gain true life, which is an intimate experience with God and a greater return reward in eternity. Let me say this as I close. I just want to say to you all this. We have a job. And the reason why I'm sticking on this discipleship piece is because the whole word of God is very, very important and critical to our existence and critical to us walking in his authority. I need to know the word of God. I need to know the assignment. But I can't just gloss over the commands that God has given me. I'm responsible for teaching that here. I'm responsible for living that here. Not just in this building, but to the people that I serve. Now, you may say, well, the people that you're pastor over? No, the people that I serve. I'm responsible for that. And I don't want to stand before God and he look at me and, and say, well, what happened? And you know what we're going to say? Well, well, what happened was... We got the Tommy, you know, the W problem. What, 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 what happened was, that's not what I want to do. And I don't want you to stand before God and talk about what, what, what happened was. You have to make sure that you are doing what the word of God tells you to do. You have to make sure that you are living and lining up with the word. This is why we're going to go on this journey through the New Testament in this 52 weeks. Well, I don't have email stuff to receive it. Okay, I got 35 copies sitting in there in the office that I have posted up here on, on the desk. If you can't get out, call me, I'll bring it to you. Because it's important for you to know and for you to be in line on this journey. The fast, you probably say, what are we fasting from? We, if we're not walking in authority, that's the first thing we need to be fasting about is God show me, help me, to move from the couch to out. Help me to learn how to baptize. Help me to learn how to teach others your way. If, that's, that's, if you don't start nowhere else, start right there. Show me, God. Help me. Help my unbelief. Help my doubt. Help me to understand the word. Help me to rightly divide the word. That's what I'm going to fast about. One chapter a week. I mean, one chapter per day, five days a week. And we will finish this journey from February 1st, 2021. We'll end right at the end of January 2022. Now, if you one of those, you know, kind of like to just be on top of your game game, right? Then read seven days a week. Read five chapters a day. If that's what you want, it's not a matter of, it's not a race. This is a marathon. And in this marathon, we're going to glean some knowledge on the way. So if you read five chapters and you don't and you don't even you can't quote one scripture out of that five, then you need to stop trying to, to be speedy. Don't be the hare. Be the tortoise in this race. Be the one that's be that one. 
Be that one that's galloping along, picking up golden nuggets here and there. Take a journal, good ink pen, write down the scripture that comes to mind. Memorize it. Make a worship song out of it. I don't care if you can't sing. Everybody can't sing like I can sing. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just where it is. I'm a great singer, so, so what? <laughs> I can't sing either, but that's all right. But look, because I write music now. But anyway, we need to make sure that we are going through this thing together. I guarantee you at the end, at the middle of this journey, we're going to see a change in our lives. In fact, I guarantee after a month, we're going to see some changes in our lives. When we end that word, and you are to pick a day and time, I mean, I'm sorry, pick a time on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, of when you're going to get with God. And make it that day, and make it that time. Try to make it that time. I understand circumstances come up, but don't let night fall and you have not read your chapter. If you do, you got Sunday, Saturday and Sunday to make it up. So I'm asking everyone, please, we're going to start the reading. I have, we have it in Google Classroom. I believe it's online. I'm not sure, but if it's not, we'll get it there. But we have different means for you to understand this fast. Pick a partner. Have somebody hold you accountable, you hold them accountable. In fact, what I would even ask you, if you want to start bringing people to Jesus, I would even encourage you to pick somebody maybe at your job. Maybe someone you know in your family that ain't lining up like they should. Tell them to go on the journey with you. Read with them. If they can't read, read to them. I'm just saying, I'm not, and I'm not being funny when I say that. Get a Bible that you understand. Some people just don't understand the King James Version. Some people may not understand New American Standard. Some people, I read Christian Standard Bible. I read New Living Translation. Go through it. Come on, Mikhail, go through it. And just, just take your time. Take your time. We'll get to the finish line together. Take your time. Fast. Three weeks straight. 21 days. Turn down your plate. If you have to eat something with medication, don't say pastor told you. you nope, nope, nope. Here's my disclaimer. Call your physician and get his permission to be able to miss a, miss a meal or whatever. Don't put that back on me. And this is recorded. So I'm just saying. But I want you to do this. It's important. And then we're going to go through the Old Testament later. See what I'm saying? I, I need you to understand that we got to get in this Bible. We got to get. Apostle Hill taught us that don't just hear up here, but get into the word for who? For yourself. Because at the end of the day, you're accountable for you. Amen? Ah, Father, we thank you. And we lift you up, God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus that someone heard your word today, God. I pray in the name of Jesus someone took it personal today, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus, someone will act on what they heard, Lord. I pray, God, that they would even research, Lord, in the name of Jesus, what was said. And find that your word is your word, God. I just pray, God, that your will be done, that you would be glorified and you would be lifted up through this whole process, God. You, Lord, meet us, God. Meet us and take us through, God. Walk us through, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus to be better. Father, we don't want to get to the end of the 52 weeks and have learned nothing. Therefore, we have wasted one year. Ah, God. 
Help us, Lord, in our unbelief. Help us in our laziness. Help us, Lord God, in our, Lord, doubt. Help us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, from allowing those things that are hindrances, whether it be a person or things, God. Help us, Lord God, to move past those things. Let us be better, Lord God. Let us, Lord God, help us to walk as kingdom disciples. Let us, God, walk in your power, God. Help us, Lord Jesus, not allow discipleship to be a missing key in our life. Help us, Jesus. And we'll give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to prepare ourselves for offering. And as you know, you can go to a number of our ways of giving. Go to clfmi.church and you will see on there where you can use Tithely, you can use Venmo, you can use Cash App. You can even mail your check in to Christian Love Fellowship Ministries at 1601 Stanford, Ypsilanti, Michigan, 48198. That is a form of worship, our giving. That's a form of trust and believing in the Father. Trust me, He knows your needs. He knows your needs. And God is not slowful in answering at all. I'm a living witness. Do we got any witnesses out there that's a living witness that as we give, as we sow into the kingdom, anybody online, if you're a living witness, give me the hands up online. You are a living witness that your giving is key. God does not want your money. He wants your heart. Ah, oh God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, as I close, uh, am I supposed to say anything, Andy? Oh, yes. Please be in prayer for Gary Chick's mom, who is in the hospital. Please be praying for him and the family. Uh, continue to pray for my buddy Greg Bradshaw, who is healing. The surgery of the hip replacement went well. Yes. Amen. He is watching online right now, so give him a high five. Brother G, we love you, man. Keep, keep him in prayer. Keep Kim in prayer as they care for her. She cares for my brother. He is moving around. Oh. Continue. Oh, also, praise report. We can't, Pastor Angie said that her brother Doug, our brother was, you know, on the ventilator and everything. He is walking, talking, and he is off that ventilator. Woo, glory to God. Glory to God. And I want to tell you, thank you for all you guys who came out. Yesterday, it was a great time. God did something different yesterday. He, a lot of people didn't come out. And I think it was, it was about, what, 19 degrees yesterday. But still, they set up, new life came. Christian love came and we set up and had food ready and out there bagged. And I said, you know what? People gonna eat. I refuse to let people be hungry on my watch. And we loaded up cars. I posted up at the grocery stores in the parking lot, posted up at gas stations, went to Sycamore, delivered food and praise God, every drop of grub, I'm sorry, food, was delivered. So I just praise God for that. And not only that, while the, the praise team was in here rehearsing yesterday, a lady, a random lady just came, knocked on the door out there. They went to the door and she just sold a seed into the ministry. Don't know why or where, it doesn't matter. She sold a seed into the house. I was driving up in Sycamore and seen a guy in the car and he had his head down. And I said, you know what, brother? I got some grub, I got some grub in the trunk right now. I, I'm going to put it in your car and bless you. He said, he rolled his window down and started wiping his face. And he said, you know what? 
I was praying to God. Because I'm tired of being how, who I, how I used to be. I want to be different. What an opportunity to speak into his life. Oh my God, he said, I promise you, you will see my face. Well, I know because I have his address. I know where he lives. And I know the car. So I just thank God for that. And the last thing I seen, the young boy was getting out at the gas station on the corner of Holmes and Ford Boulevard. And I said, hey man, I got some food and meats and stuff in here. Can I bless you? And he said, you sure can. In fact, I didn't even want to come to no gas station because I knew I had to go to the store. Now nah, I ain't got to go nowhere. I can go home. And I said, well, bless God, brother. What church you go to? I, I need to start getting my cars, y'all, because I got them upstairs. I need to start taking them because people are asking when you do something, what church you go to? They're going to ask y'all the same things. We got to put something in their hands. We're going to get on that immediately. Get some cards out. So when you're going out talking to people, tell them where you, where you worship at. Tell them some of the stuff that we're doing. Invite them. But most importantly, tell them about Jesus. And don't wait until they come to church to tell them about Jesus. Tell them right then. Because you don't know if their time is up within the next hour or two. And here's another challenge. Police officer was posted right there, Cheney. And I'm driving and I'm saying, I got, some, I got somewhere to be. I stopped, whipped in right next to him. And it's a young officer. He had to be it's like he's about in his mid 20s, young dude. And I said, Hey, man, I'm the pastor down in Christian Love. Can I pray for you? And he said, You sure can. He took his hat off and bowed his head. I'm looking like, Okay. I, we just, we got to praying. Because here's what I believe. I know what the world says. I know the things that's happening out there. I get it. But that doesn't change my position as a man of God, as someone who believes in the gospel. I'm going to pray for him. And I believe that the prayer that was prayed for him was a seed planted in his life. Harm could have been waiting for him on his job. He may not have gotten home alive or in peace that day. I'm not saying that it's about me. I'm, I'm nothing. But I wanted to be used as an instrument of the gospel, of the king, of the father. Sometimes just roll up on it and roll up lightly. Don't fly in there. Roll the window down and say, hey, man, can I, can I just pray for you? Somebody in the store, just pray for him. You know, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. Be bold. Between now and next Sunday, I want you to be bold. Even if you're in the grocery store and you got to hold up the line. Pray for that woman behind the counter that's waiting on you. I'm just saying, don't just say, I'm going to pray for you when I leave. Pray now. And don't make no long winded prayer. Pray something that they can repeat. If you just said, Father, help this woman, help this man in Jesus' name. I'm saying, we got to be bold. We can't be Christians out here doing this. Is it safe? Anybody out there? We have to be people who are going to be sought. We're going to go out there and change the flavor. We're going to be bold, intentional. Being a believer does not equal being a chump. We have to stand and let the world see and hear. But understand this, they also will see and hear your nonsense. So you walk right. Father, thank you for those of, of us, Lord God, today. Be with us as we continue on our journey through this week and this day. And we give you praise. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I love you guys. Love you guys online. Praise God for everyone. We'll be back to talk about some part two next week. Amen? Amen. And thank you, David Betts. Great, great video, brother. Amen. Take care, guys. Let's take it.